welcome to this final panel, Transitional Justice After Post-Communism, Look to the Next 25 Years. My name is Paul Betts. I'm in the History Department and the Director of the European Studies Center. And you notice on the screen we're celebrating our 40th anniversary uh, this spring. We've had a whole range of events on uh, European politics, culture, and society. Uh, and so uh, this is one of them. And uh, I want to thank Carolina for organizing this, uh, this whole thing. I know how much work goes into this. So I think uh, on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for all the work you've done. Um, Okay, I think you'll find that this panel in many ways builds on some of the themes that are raised in the last one. We've got three uh, speakers. I'm just going to do this very quickly. Everybody has their program, so there's no reason to run through uh, kind of biographies and a whole list of publications, because if we had done so, I'd be here for a very, very long time, uh, given, these, uh, given these speakers. So I'll start them by just doing a quick introduction of each speaker, and then each one has 15 to 20 minutes or so to speak, and then we'll just open up to a general conversation, if that's okay. So first we have Alexander Smola, who was just here a few weeks ago giving a talk uh, in this room. He's a former chairman of the Stefan Batori Foundation in Warsaw. He no, also no former. No, as oh, far as I know, I was not. Oh, yet no. kicked out, oh. although I cannot exclude it. <laughs> so acting chairman, like I said, of uh, the Foundation of Warsaw. Of course, he's been in Paris for many years, at in RF. Uh, his latest book was Le Grand Secuse, which I guess is translated as The Great Shock. Um, in terms of Europe, 1989 to 1990. Uh, he's written on transition for many years. He's going to provide a, a little presentation for us today. Uh, next, then, we have uh, David Priestland, who teaches here at Oxford. Uh, he's well known to many of you, having published this uh, uh, important book on red flag communism and the making of the modern world in 2009, followed up by another book that he published a few years ago on Merchant, Soldier, and Sage, A New History of Power, published in 2013. And then, of course, we'll have uh, Jan uh, Goss of Princeton University, who is going to give 10 or 15 minutes, I think, of just uh, comments, reflections on the um, other papers. He, of course, is very well known to all the people here. He published his book on neighbors in 2001. He's also worked on the politics of retribution, Holocaust history, and a range of other things. So I think we're very well placed to have all these three speakers. So again, I'll just start with uh, Alexander, you've got, again, 15, 20 minutes, then we'll pass it to David, and then to John, and yeah. then open conversation. You are more, more liberal. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I will present sort of a revisionist version of, of the history and of, uh, of political problems of political justice in, in Poland. Uh, the, uh, rather speaking in macro political terms than uh, on uh, precisely on the problem of, 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 of justice. My th thesis first is that we do not have the same type of political justice all the period after 89. That today we have very different type of problem of how to deal with the past in comparison with the 90s. To deal the major problem is not how to deal with communist past, but how to deal with post-communism, which is very different problems. It deals with a whole range of different of different problems, and I, I, the, it, it will be the major part of what I have to to say. Uh, I, I will talk. Uh, I will talk about it. But um, uh, also, what is behind? What what sort of of needs? Uh, uh, axiological, political, uh, are behind this change, which is quite quite significant. Uh, but I will start with this, uh, let's say, first transition, uh, trans transitional justice uh, after '89. This is quite similar to 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 other countries, with of course with the exception that it was extremely successful opposition and very strong, much stronger than in other countries, that it was peaceful, tra uh, peaceful tra transition, uh, that we had practically constituted very quickly three blocks, one post-communist, as was called. It, actually, very interesting, the term is not practically not used anymore in, 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 in Poland. Uh, afterwards, let, let's say the ex-solidarity opposition uh, broke down practically in two blocks. I, I would call them moderates and radicals, because it was not yet philosophical choice, the po choice of different political uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, of, of, of different type of modernization. Um, the, uh, then, at the beginning, the differences, to speak in organizational terms, of the between milieu of today's power, uh, peace, and the liberals, uh, who were autour the people uh, uh, very well known in, in Polish post-89 uh, uh, history, like, like Wałęsa, starting with Wałęsa, but afterwards Mazowiecki, Geremek, Kuroń, 
was not really substantial as far as the vision of development of Poland. They were modernizers, they were pro-Westerners, they were radicals. They were speaking about speeding up the process. But the process, fundamentally, they shared the vision of this process with others. With one, however, difference, but which appears only in 91, not from the very beginning. This is the problem of how to deal with old, old communist elites. This is the problem of the communization and the illustration. It didn't appear from the very beginning. The, let's say, I cannot say that this negotiated transition was accepted by everybody, but almost by everybody. There was a small group which, which didn't, which didn't uh, let's say, uh, which uh, didn't accept. So this uh, difference is, in a way, classical difference and uh, present in the other countries. Uh, and uh, that's true that uh, illustration, the communization, didn't work very well in Poland. Why? First, Poland was dominated by liberal, by liberal, let's say, uh, and leftist uh, um, uh, elites, and and for them, uh, certainly the, the future building, the institution, the, the transformation of the economy was much more important than than to deal with the past. Afterwards, they were negotiating with the communists and uh, pactum sum servatum. Uh, you should respect the agreement. And it was actually the first disagreement. Kaczynski was saying, no, the law which uh, uh, agreement which was practically imposed because there were no inequality, which was true between solidarity side and communist side, are not bounding. The moment we can get rid of it, we should get rid of it. It was practically the beginning of political conflict. But it was conflicts to a big extent determined by generational uh, factor. Uh, uh, the, 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 the people around Kaczynski were younger, 10, 15 years younger, uh, usually quite often less educated. They, they had their own ambitions, so the language quite often they adopted to, 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 their, to their ambitions. But I will move further, which is more, which is more interesting, closer to, 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 to today. Uh, there, there's radicalization of language. The, the moment they took for the first time power in 2005, they are talking about plots, about uh, hidden agreements between communists and part of the solidarity elites. Uh, um, the, the, you know, uh, they didn't call them yet traitors, but this is today a language quite, uh, quite, 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 quite often, uh, quite often used. But very interestingly, the the most important sentence which during the uh, election campaign, which assured practically the the success, was not at all about getting rid of of communists, it was against liberals. It was solidarity against liberals. This is the way they defined in the crucial moment when they were fighting for power in 2005, they defined the dividing, major defined, dividing line. Which uh, it's quite interesting, it was not true at the moment, yes, because the person who, when they won, uh, assured the, uh, you, 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 you know, the, the ruled the economy was uh, Extreme liberal. This is uh, Mrs. Zita Diloska. She was a liberal. She came from the party of Tusk. She was liberal. So, uh, in a way, it was totally instrumentalized. Even then, the difference was was not was not uh, was not so big. Uh, now, uh, uh, let's say. Uh, I, I, I did look at. That. Why did you start this? Oh, oh, yeah. oh okay. That's, that's okay. So uh, let's let's come uh, closer uh, to to today's perspective. Today, the situation is is very different. It's defined in different way. This is the the conflict between. This is already on the, uh, the during election campaign. Patriots are coming back. So patriots, they are defining themselves as a, as, as a patriots, and this is very important definition. The nation over everything, this is what actually Carolina was quoting, it's quite amazing sentence, although not surprising of, of Mr. Mrs. Uh, uh, Gavin, vice minister, who was supposed to, to be here when she was saying that uh, revolution in memory, they are supposed to, to assure, uh, this, it will be putting Polish suffering first. 
But this is just this, this is my formulation. Putting Polish suffering first is just my interpretation. Ah, your interpretation. Okay. But this is uh, this is this is this is obvious. This is in different forms. This is this is repeated. This is repeated uh, very often. This is, uh, for example, this is in attacks against uh, my neighbor. <laughs> Jan, uh, Jan Gross, the, the, the formula is very often used, uh, this is pedagogy of shame, that he is uh, the, the main representatives of this pedagogy of shame, and that we should get rid of, the, that this is, the, should be the pedagogy of national fierté, of national dignity. And this is one of the major dimensions of, 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 of this, uh, of this, of this uh, uh, policy. So, so the nation at the center, uh, dignity of of, uh, of 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 the nation. Uh, also, in the the, the student in their uh, in their ca campaign, uh, certain social concessions were very present. Social social policy. When with the self destruction of the left, practically the peace was the only party which represented those, uh, let's say, demands of 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 popular. Of the a big part of the of the society of underdogs, let's say in the in the in the society, it plays also a role. This, this continuity we can we can see they are trying to impose upon the process of last 25 years. This is, for example, the appearance of certain names which were identifying with the Polish revolution or transition, roundtable negotiation. The names like. Uh, Tadeusz Mazowiecki, like Lasek Kuroń, like Bronisław Geremek, totally disappeared. It's mean, of course, the, Poland is a pluralistic country. You have private media. Public are totally controlled by the power, but they are private media uh, and it's quite inf influential. Um, uh, of course, they are oppositional parties, so they are present, but never in official discourse. So this is very interesting. Who is replacing them? The, ex-president of the republic, the, the brother of, of the leader of, of the camp of, of peace, who uh, died in tragic crash, uh, airplane crash, in April uh, 2010, Lech, uh, Lech Kaczynski. He became, uh, that's, that's quite amazing, uh, some sentences uh, which are still implicit, but we will have more and more explicit sentences of Jarosław Kaczynski. Um, uh, uh, we must uh, adjust uh, uh, a quote translation. Uh, we must remember the first president, Lech Kaczynski, who represented the highest value of a free, independent, and dignified Poland. I just want to remind you that before him, that there was Wałęsa, with all his shortcomings. However, he is national hero and really one of the symbols of, of the 20th century. No, uh, the, there was Kwaśniewski, very popular president, but with ex-communist cap but very liberal, very democratic. Uh, and there was afterwards Bronisław Gomorowski, who, who uh, to say the truth, had more participated in the opposition activities than, not with than Lech Kaczynski, who, who died, but then Jarosław Kaczynski was, was better now. So to say it, it's, it's, it's quite obvious this is objective. This is the real beginning of independent Poland. This is the real beginning. And there are two elements of this beginning. First, this is the election and presidency, tragic presidency of Olaf Kaczynski. Actually, he was very unpopular as a president. When there was a crash uh, of airplane, uh, a few months before election, he had m less than 20% of support. Uh, but afterwards, he became as a symbol, that's true, very popular in Poland, as a symbol of traditional, romantic, suffering, uh, Poland. He became a, a very interesting uh, uh, symbol, not only for, for this camp. But uh, the, the other symbol, it was this crash itself, the Smolensk. It was in Smolensk, or Smolensk. It was symbolically also the place where 20,000 of Polish officers, intellectuals, and so on, were killed by the Soviets. This is actually why he was there. He was there to, to commemorate the anniversary of, 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 of this event. So there was a sort of uh, um, natural, spontaneous unity of two facts in the memory, in the perception of Poles, but of course also interpretation which was given. So he was, became the suffering and this victim, 
uh, expiatory victim became the symbol of New Poland. We didn't have such a symbol in 1809. It was peaceful transition. And actually, we have the problem with establishing when started this Poland. It's a roundtable tradition. It was the version which was popularized by Gazeta Wyborcza. For uh, the election of 4th June, we will have big manifestation now of opposition and of, of court. Uh, you know, it was semi-free election. The first government was Mazowiecki. There were still communists then. You, you know, th there is the problem. Where is this continuity of the process between communist system or they are proposing? Kaczynski and the, and the smallest strategy, especially that interpretation they are inter trying to impose, uh, that, it is, it was the, the, that it was the result of the plot that he was killed, that he and 95 other pol higher politicians, military men, uh, you know, big part of Polish political elite, they were killed. By whom they were killed? Russians are always there. But quite often, there are also Polish elites, governing elites, with, with suggestion that Tusk participated himself. He will never say it openly, but implicitly, this is very often, um, this is very often uh, said. And actually, the language of treason became quite popular because they have a problem. When you are defining who we are, we are patriots this time. The definition who we are changes in the time. This is quite interesting. On the beginning, it was solidarity. We are solidarity. We are against ex-communists. Afterwards, we were solidarity against liberals. Now, we are patriots. But patriots are, are against whom? You know, traitors is a little bit dangerous, given that 70% of the population didn't vote for them, however. So, of course, they are defining, they are narrowing this definition, that they are the leaders, that those who are, like myself, talking to foreigners and telling uh, slanders about Poland. This is probably why two representatives, close people very close to this, uh, to this power, didn't come to our conference. Probably, but although I'm not sure. I hope not, that it was not written. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, the, so the language is there, but they cannot generalize. And of course, this is the major problem in Carl Schmidt, which was mentioned already. In Carl Schmidt definition, we are against, against enemies. The enemies, is, there is difficulty to, to define the enemies. This is their problem, which I think is very important. But now the last part, I'm, I'm sorry, the last, the, last, the last part. Why? Why this? change. I think that this is very important change. This is the change of fundamental also message. They are not any modern modernizer. They are not similar to the liberal elites of the 90s. No, today Kaczynski, he said, we want, of course, modernization. Modernization meaning like in Peter the Great. Uh, economy, administration, uh, this is modernization. But we don't want modernization of Polish soul. I'm quoting, exactly. <laughs> we don't want modernization of Polish soul. It's mean, we are against, of course, homosexual marriages. We are against, we are against all those, you know, perversity of the West. This is very interesting. This is very interesting point we are. It concerns not only Poland, several countries of the region, but especially Poland. In 89, we were against Soviet Union. Still then, we were, we were against Soviet Union. We were moving to the West. It was the objective everybody accepted. Today, we are also against another civilization, not only Eastern, South, Islam. We are also against Western civilization, which is demoralization, which is decadence, which is postmodernism, um, gender studies. Gender studies and so on. This is very interesting. I mean, I'm not saying that this is everywhere present, but. In the, the, in the discourse of official politicians, but especially intellectuals close to the power, this language appears almost every day about decadence, that we are really the real union, re Europe of tradition, of real value, of Christianity. Paradoxically, it's the same language that John Paul II used when he wanted, really, he dreamed that the Poland become the Piemont in Polish language, political language, the Piemont of Europe, the point of re recurring, you know, uh, Europe for Christianity. Practically, they are saying the same thing, but they are in defensive. John Paul II, he dreamed it was very offensive. It was also democratic and liberal vision. They are very pessimist. They are, they are, this, their vision is apocalyptic of Europe. They are against European Union, although they would not, they would not say it. And the, and the last sentences. 
You know, there's Michael Walzer, last year published a book, I, I, will, I will find the, the title of the book, which is very, which is very, I will not find, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't even look for, because anyway, I'm, oh yeah, uh, The Paradox of Liberation, Secular Revolutions and Religious Contrevolutions. His thesis is, and he is based upon the three cases, this is India, Israel, and Algeria that more or less after 25 years of modernization, of liberation of those countries, assured by secular liberal elites, and modernization of the countries, there is a religious backlash. Religious backlash, re religious revival, religious counter-movement, uh, counter whatever you define. I mean, he, he cannot prove it. Of course, three cases, this is not, but, but this is amazing. This is exactly what we see in Poland today. Because what is very important in the Polish case, this is the dimension of cultural war. And this is the difference between Poland and, and, and even, even, uh, even Hungary, uh, where the big, biggest part of the population is not really religious. Um, in urban talks, there is religious present, but this is never. In Poland, we have really religious conflict. So you see, to coming back to transition justice, I was not talking uh, about uh, uh, at all. This is to, today. This is how to deal with the elites of of uh, of the modernist elites, the elites which ruled Poland, uh, anti-Catholic elites which ruled Poland after '89, and there is very close alliance with with the Church. The, the chairman of the, of the conference of the Polish church said, and he co he's conservative, but he's considered at the same time as a quite liberal person. He said, we never had as good relation with the power, political power as we have today. And this is true. And this is true. And uh, I think that fundamentally behind, there is the problem of refusal. Um, th this is quite often re a reaction to the modernization Isaiah Berlin described it in the case of of Germany. Uh, he was considered treating uh, German romanticism as a nationalist reaction to imitative developments, also of dignity, reaction of dignity. We have very similar elements. Similar. So this is an element of generalization, not to limit myself to the Polish, uh, uh, to, to the Polish story. Thank you very much for your attention. Very good. Well, kind of shift from culture to economics, I think, with uh, David's well, presentation. Well, and, and also from to, to massive generalizations from Alexander's <laughs> more uh, more more uh, detailed, um, more Polish-centric paper. I just want to stress: I'm originally a Russianist. I'm really a Russianist, and now I'm working on economic transitions in the '90s from a sort of social, uh, from a cultural history perspective. So I'm not an expert on Poland. And I'm uh, not an expert on transnational justice, but I've been asked to talk about the role of the economic transformations on this issue of memory and ask if there's a relationship between those two. Um, and, of course, these issues have come to the fore recently in Poland because peace has started to advocate quite a welfareist policy. And so, in a way, uh, economics is now in the political frame much more than it has been in the past in terms of these political conflicts. And so I suppose the question I want to ask is, are we seeing a transition from memory wars over the communist past to wars over the 1990s, of the Balcerovich reforms? Or what's the relationship between those two? Uh, what is the relationship between the nationalist politics of the memory warriors or the monomic warriors and economic transformation? I think it's likely to be there's likely to be some relationship, even in uh, quite successful, economically successful countries like Poland, relatively economically successful countries like Poland. Of course, Poland's much more, be much more successful in the transitions than most other countries in the region. But I think, as Alexander said in, in his um, recent talk the other week, actually, uh, despite macro growth, question, uh, macro growth success, there's been enormous churn and a huge number of losers as well as winners in this process. So massive status changes. And so that this re economic revolution in the 90s and 2000s is very likely to have major uh, political um, uh, implications, not just in places like Russia, where there's been clearly a collapse, but in Poland also. 
Now, I suppose, so what is the relationship between, between culture and economics? I suppose there's the, uh, the Obama theory, which, as, as he said, that uh, economic problems make people bitter and people cling to their guns and religion, um, as he explained at the rise of Trump and the far right and uh, the Tea Party. Now, that clearly is a very crude way of looking at it, and things are much more complex than that. And actually, things don't look, do look quite complex in the region, because actually... Looking at it superficially, there seems to be a bit of an inverse relationship between arguments, uh, political systems where there have been uh, big arguments about economic issues and um, uh, political systems where there have been major conflicts over the communist past. So in Poland and Hungary, as has already been pointed out, we see political parties actually have been much more in agreement in, throughout the 90s and 2000s over economic issues, and, much, and there's been much more disagreement about the communist past than, say, somewhere like uh, the Czech Republic um, or Russia, actually, where I would argue that there's been much less angry disagreement about the communist past and, and more disagreement about economics. So, um, and, and, and also and there seems to be a relationship between that, th this and what Jan Kubik was saying yesterday, which is that in Hungary and Poland, where we've had the most peaceful transitions through pacts, we've had most arguments about communist memory and the largest number of mnemonic warriors. But I think there's also something else peculiar about these countries, um, that memory wars have taken a particular form. Um, so if you compare that the main issue in, in Poland and Hungary has been who betrayed the national cause and who collaborated with the communists and by implication the Russians or the Soviets, the imperialists. So I think in some ways it helps to see this as almost a post-colonial issue about imperialism. Um, and national identity, as well as one about communism. That is, what is the relationship between... The, the argument is about who collaborated with the foreigners, as well as who was a communist. Now, in other countries, uh, the other countries I mentioned, Czech Republic, um, Hung Russia, the GDR, uh, you do get arguments about the communist past, but they're much more closely associated with issues of economics and socioeconomic strategy. So the pro-market um, liberals will accuse the economic left of going back to communism. We've seen this in Czech, Czech, Czech Republic and Russia also. Russia, the main divisions uh, throughout the 90s and 2000s, okay, it's had a very unstable party system, but the, the, the research on opinion suggests there's a relationship, really socioeconomic cleavages, divisions are much the most important, and that is then related secondarily to the question of your view of the communist past. So uh, liberals will be much more uh, critical of the communist past and, and argue that the 1990s was a good time, the, the uh, pro-left, more welfareist people, uh, left on economic issues, will argue that the communist past was um, a golden age and um, uh, that the 1990s was a disaster. And so issues of national identity and betrayal of, to foreigners and to imperialists has been much less important in these, in these debates. Um, now, if we make that comparison between these two groups of countries, um, and I'm afraid my comparison, comparison isn't as ambitious and is rather more sort of rushed than Jan's, but um, I, I, hope, I hope it's a helpful comparison, I think that that's a significant difference. So actually there have been arguments about the communist past in Russia, in the Czech Republic, but they've been less fraught. And, and that's not surprising given the different nature of those conflicts. Um, it, it's... Um, it's much more likely, you're much more likely to have a, a, a highly fraught debate if the issue is about national purity and betrayal and collaboration with imperialists than if you're having an argument about socioeconomic strategy. Um, so I think that helps to explain why Polish and Hungarian politics has been so much more divided on, on these issues. Now, to understand why these issues... So I think we've now got to go back a step, I suppose, and ask why these issues are so much more important in Poland and Hungary and not so much elsewhere. And, of course, Jan Kubik's argument yesterday was that this has a lot to do with the nature of the transition and the pacts um, after the end of, of communism. 
Now, I think this is a huge question, of course, and I don't have much time to talk about it, but I think, I think that's a very interesting way, uh, you know, uh, uh, analysis, and I would absolutely agree with it. But it may be worth thinking uh, in a slightly broader context of questions of political cleavages. And so here I, I want to refer to political scientist Herbert Kitchell's analysis of, of, cleav of political cleavages. And, and he would argue, or he argues, that the pacts that Jan uh, Kubik was talking about in Poland and Hungary and Slovenia um, emerged from a particular type of communist regime and a particular type of uh, party system afterwards. So these regimes were national accommodative regimes, as he calls them, relatively liberal communists, reformist communist parties, making concessions to an ultimately victorious opposition. And, and therefore there were no significant divisions, strong divisions between pro-market and leftist, economic leftist forces. So the transition, of course, is easier because you're not having these major divisions over those issues. Um, and is much more peaceful, and there's much more agreement on economic reform, and, and that is also the case after in the in, 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 after after 1989 amongst the successor parties. Now this contrasts with a group of uh, that Kitchell identifies as the bureaucratic authoritarian regimes, by which he means the Czech Republic and the GDR, which did not end as a result of pacts, which had more entrenched authoritarian communist parties that actually had quite a commitment to, um, to, to welfareist, um, some sort of communist welfareist policies. Uh, this led to much sharper conflict between emerging economic liberal parties, neoliberal parties if you want to call them that, and so, so this conflict over economic issues becomes much more dominant after 1989. Now, Russia is not part of Kitchell's framework for various complicated reasons, but I think in a way that fits the similar type of, of model, uh, at least in terms of divisions, that the divisions um, uh, before and after, after, after um, 1991 were very sharp on the economic question of uh, markets versus planet versus state state statist economics. And in these countries, these bureaucratic, the Czech Republic, GDR, well, I suppose GDR is, slightly, is rather different, but, but uh, Czech Republic, Russia, socioeconomic questions are the main basis of party cleavage, or political cleavage, let's say. The issue, and the issue of the communist past is refracted through that. So in Russia, economic liberals tend to be westernizers, economic leftists, the more communist nostalgics, um, and these issues uh, are also present in the Czech Republic and indeed in the GDR. Yet in the case of, the, uh, of Poland, Hungary, um, and in the national accommodation, uh, accommodative regimes, the main cleavages are not socioeconomic, primarily. They, um, well, initially, as, as you said, they're, they're, they're not very significant, but you could say that there's all, what, what's, what, what's important, or what becomes more important, at least, is, is much more uh, the, the division between cultural liberals and cultural conservatives. And that is connected, um, in large part, with the issue of, of communism and imperialism. That is, uh, did the elite collaborate or not? Did the elite collaborate with the imperial power, with the communist power? And so that question of elites and collaboration is crucial from the very beginning. And then that starts to become associated with a whole question, set of questions um, about uh, you one's attitude to the nation and, and the traditional culture of the nation versus the attitude towards foreigners um, and the attitude to, to empire. Now, the sociologist Tomasz Zaritsky has defined this as one between uh, uh, cent uh, ugly, centrists and peripheralists, as one might say, cosmopolitans and nationalists, perhaps is a better way of putting it. Those who are willing to make com compromises with the imperial centre. I suppose the old imperial centre was Moscow. It's now Brussels or Berlin. Um, and those who want to defend the integrity of national culture, um, or, or as Zaretsky calls it, the peripheral culture, whether the Polish or the Hungarian culture, against the intrusiveness of Soviet, you know, Soviet communism or Western uh, liberalism. So the political conflict develops into one primarily about national identity and foreign influence, and conservatives accuse liberals of collaboration, betraying national culture. Economic issues don't lie at the centre of political debate, but that doesn't mean economics is irrelevant, I would argue, because clearly there are losers and winners. And so who do the losers blame 
their problems on? How do they analyse this problem of, of, of economic loss? They blame it on the corrupt elites who have, a, firstly, the ones who have collaborated with the old communists because they've somehow had privileges, they've got the property and they, they've lots of, lots of insider deals. And then eventually, of course, well, that may be changing now and there may be more, more emphasis on, 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 uh, on, on market, on, on neoliberals and I'll come on to that. So I think this rather different relationship, so to come back to my original question, what is the relationship between economic issues and cultural identity, these nationalist issues? I think they're different in different countries, and I think it helps to explain why these peaceful transitions that uh, Jan Kubik was mentioning to uh, communism, uh, to post-communism, have actually led to such poisonous politics. Um, because um, this issue of imperial collaboration is inevitably one that is very difficult to compromise on. You can compromise on economic issues. Yes, in Russia, lot people com accused uh, lots of people, economic leftists, let's say, accused Gaidar et al. of being westernisers uh, in collaboration with the West. They accuse Gorbachev, of course, of selling out to the West, all of these things. But ultimately, the issue is one of uh, socioeconomic interests, and you can compromise over those interests. And ultimately, people think it's about socioeconomic interests. If the issue is about who betrayed the nation to foreigners, and we have this whole Tagovitsa-type rhetoric, then that's much more difficult to, to, to overcome. Um, and um, so, so that would be my first argument. And I think this also relates to the question of why this conflict might be most, so much more intense now than it was in the 1990s and 2000s, or early 2000s. I think that the economic turbulence of 2008 has affected the region, I mean, clearly affected the region to different degrees, but it has a huge effect, has had a huge effect. More in Hungary than in Poland. Um, but we saw, I think we saw the effect very clearly in Hungary that um, the effect of the debt crisis was very immediate. And it was in this context uh, that Viktor Orban really came into his own. He got a lot of support over this financial crisis and over the whole issue of mortgages and all of those questions. And in a way, he's now been able to, if you like, reinforce the old anti-communist message with an anti-EU, anti-neoliberal message. Um, that is, you know, the real problem, a sort of nationalistic resentment of, of Western neoliberalism, of Brussels, of banks. And so he's managed to combine the sort of anti-Soviet imperialism with the anti-Brussels imperialism message and mobilise people around this nationalist message of we've got to defend our national identity against these foreign forces. Now, in Poland, clearly, the, the effect of the financial crisis, I mean, it was there, but it was, it was less. Even so, it, 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 like in the whole region and everywhere, including this country, everywhere, it's having, having an effect. And so I think at least that's one... Perhaps it helps to explain why uh, these parties, these national identity parties, anti-cosmopolitan parties, have now got another string to their bow. And that string is welfareism and hostility to neoliberal cosmopolitanism, as well as to these um, com you know, pro uh, communist elites or supposed communist elites. And so you know, the idea of an alliance but, or some combination between these um, communist collaborators and liberal collaborators it seems very convincing. Okay, so just briefly, where, where then? What, what, what's going to happen? What, what, what's the, what are the implications of this analysis for the future? Um, are there solutions to this? Um, and here, I suppose, Jan Kubik's very important question about you know one as a social scientist or I'm not really a social scientist as a historian one can uh, come up with sort of structural explanations but of course the problem with that is that sounds as if well where are we you know that there are no ways out there are no solutions to this problem um, there are these party cleavages there are these party differences and these arguments it's very difficult to escape those is that can anything be done um, and it's it is the responsibility of uh, you know of, of, of at least involved academics to, to um, think of solutions. I'm afraid I can only see things getting worse at the moment, 
um, as the EU and the West generally fails to resolve its economic problems. And I know this is a rather economic determinist approach, but I, I suppose that, that does convince me at the moment at least that as long as we have these, um, this crisis, in, in this economic crisis, and it's as much a crisis of economic uh, confidence and thinking among liberal elites, really, as much as a sort of actual crisis of people in poverty. Um, but as long as we have um, at the, uh, it appearing that the people running the world economy and the EU and uh, Brussels, um, uh, the EU economy, don't know what they're doing, which I'm afraid is the impression one gets now, um, and, and, and it's the impression a lot of people are getting, as long as one has that ideological crisis, then I think these uh, nationalist forces, these anti-cosmopolitan forces, will uh, increase in power. And of course that is only going to be reinforced by the migrant crisis, which is another separate crisis. Um, so that makes it even more difficult for external forces to do anything about it. I mean, I, I noticed in the current um, uh, the current uh, issue of the London Review of Books, Jan van der Muller, in a very interesting article on the British role in the EU and Brexit, criticising Cameron uh, for, if you like, not doing more or trying to stop the EU doing more about these issues of uh, Polish liberalism and Hungarian liberalism. Now, I, I'm no expert on this, but I, I mean, the problem with EU intervention, of course, is that that can just reinforce nationalist hostility in the sense that there is this imperial power in Brussels that's telling us what to do. Um, and that can actually make the situation worse. So, um, I, how, so I suspect, my, my, my suspicion is that the solutions probably lie more in issues of, in economic issues and in issues of solving economic problems and at least coming up with some new set of economic strategies that appears convincing and gives a convincing narrative that suggests elites know what they're doing, um, I suspect that we're going to find the solutions in that area rather more than in the area of politics or indeed in terms of uh, legality and justice. Thank you very much for both of you. Then you have, I guess, what did you like? 10, 15 minutes to make some comments? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I, I'd like to ap apologize to you. My strategy for contribution to this conference uh, was uh, to wait until two of our, as it turns out, missing contributors uh, will state their claims and positions and, and then try to respond. Uh, but uh, um, they failed me again. And they are not here, and uh, so I'm a little bit in the lurch. But but I will uh, say a few things, uh, if I may, on uh, on two issues. One one of them has to do with the, the Kaczynski phenomenon. Uh, something uh, that uh, it seems to me is important, and I haven't seen it uh, stated. <coughs> Uh, openly, so to speak, uh, and the other to say a few things also about uh, the um, main subject uh, that appeared in a title of our conference, uh, uh, dealing with a difficult past and, and then transitional justice, how the two uh, mm, sort of fit together, or it seems to me don't fit together very well. So let me say a, a few things about about Kaczynski, Alik uh, Smolar had uh, um, really uh, very well um, uh, given us a, a kind of uh, review of uh, how stakes and arguments in justification of the uh, law and justice or peace uh, uh, claims for power have uh, shifted, uh, or um, in, in other words, Kaczynski's arguments uh, have shifted, uh, and I would like to add one more element to uh, uh, what uh, they have been doing, um, which uh, it, it seems to me mm, it is really very, potentially at least, mm, may have very serious consequences. Uh, it seems to me that uh, already since, um, certainly since the time of the uh, catastrophe in, in Smolensk, 
uh, what Kaczynski and his various acolytes have been doing was <coughs> to introduce into rhetoric, into the um, uh, political speech, if you wish, a, uh, a new um, semantics, in a sense. Uh, semantics which is grounded in one fundamental um, feature, namely uh, that between what they say and uh, uh, reality, empirical evidence, facts, there is no connection. And they don't worry about this. Uh, what I mean uh, will, was very well exemplified by, uh, by the whole mm, line pushed primarily, of course, by by Kaczynski's main uh, acolyte here on, on this front, Macharetic, uh, concerning the, the, the Smolensk catastrophe. This whole uh, um, re, uh, rehashed version of uh, it being a plot and uh, uh, all these various variations of uh, how it was carried out and what has happened uh, rather than uh, um, as opposed to the account that was given by this very careful study by the official commission and so forth. All of these things were, uh, from the beginning, uh, and continue to uh, this day, uh, this was complete nonsense. And, and in a very palpable and spectacular way, as, as many of you, I'm sure, remember, including uh, these alleged experts uh, of, of his uh, a, a commission then at some point, you know, revealing that they have absolutely no expertise in the field that they uh, were supposed to uh, provide um, <coughs> uh, an analysis of somebody saying, well, what do you mean? I'm not, not a, uh, an expert in aerodynamics, but I have flown on planes and through the window I've seen how, uh, how the uh, wing behaves, etc., etc. <laughs> there was, was more on this. And this was all part of a public realm, of public speech. Not only public speech, but also public speech enunciated at very important institutions. As, as you remember, this was a commission in Polish parliament. Uh, so, and not only. And of course, at the very beginning, uh, you know, most of the people would just uh, uh, shake their uh, heads and say, well, what can you expect from such? Uh, from such idiots, but but they weren't in any way um, sort of deterred from pursuing this thing. And it went on for many years. And the situation now is such that Kaczynski himself and a lot of people uh, around him can stand up and do so, and they say anything that comes to their mind, and they are totally unperturbed by the fact that it doesn't make sense, that there is no empirical evidence behind it. Or, uh, so they might raise the whole issue of the constitutional tribunal. I mean, evidently, if one looks at the constitution and the arrangement of uh, institutional order in this country, in Poland, constitutional tribunal is the entity that is empowered with the capacity to decide what's constitutional. Now, what does it matter whether Kaczynski or, or Szydło or Patryk Jaki, that's one of the very uh, prominent uh, figures that appear on various television programs and, and speaks about it, that they think otherwise. And yet, this is what holds. So Kaczynski says this is not constitutional, what constitutional tribunal is doing. And in fact, the practice is of, of state institutions such as if it were not a constitutional, what constitutional tribunal is doing. Uh, an interview that Kaczynski is giving to uh, some of his uh, of, of, uh, journalists who are very uh, friendly to him, the Karnowski brothers. I think it's, it's, it's not the, ultra, the, the last interview that he gave, but before last interview. Uh, suddenly, in the middle of the interview, he would say, well, 
European community, the European Commission is worried about the state of democracy in Poland. I mean, this is nuts. I mean, they should be worried about the state of democracy in Germany. There is no democracy in Germany. In Germany, journalists write what the government tells them to write, and parliamentarians, they don't have zero, uh, really, freedom to introduce and speak up their minds in parliamentary debates. They only do what leaders of uh, political parties do. Germany is the problem of Europe. Uh, in the last interview, we heard uh, suddenly Kaczynski saying uh, people who go to these demonstrations, God and, and parties of the oppositions, these are all mental cases, mental patients. They all should go to uh, and, and, get, and get help in that way. My point is that this is, this is, this is not a situation in which this rhetoric and, and we, as it were, catch uh, uh, this regime, so to speak, lying. This is not it. It's, it has established and, in fact, institutionalized. This is part of a political debate, uh, a situation in which uh, one can say well, uh, whatever one uh, wishes, so to speak, and cannot be challenged on it. You know, it's just... I've been thinking about, and, 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 and these discussions more and more uh, seem to emerge in Poland, to what extent this is a, uh, this is a, a, a regime uh, that, that, that leads towards fascism or fascist regime. And it occurred to me that, that in fact, this sort of disjoint uh, uh, feature of, of public speech and political debate is something that very much characterizes uh, um, fascist uh, reality, so to speak. The sort of Mussolini a sempre ragione formula of Italian fascism, or uh, Hitler's uh, just rambling, you know, Jews are responsible for everything, for capitalism, for, uh, for communism. It, it doesn't matter. You just, you can, there are these people who can say whatever they want to say, and it stands. The verbal elements also of, of this new situation, uh, and uh, again, uh, in what Alec uh, uh, Smaller just said, uh, of course, this is, uh, this is this new phenomenon. This is nationalism that comes. Uh, they, are, they are not modernizers, if you will, but, uh, but this is, they are not modernizers, uh, uh, plus there, are, there, is, there, is a certain, there are certain things uh, in addition in this uh, completely sort of uh, um, inarticulated, in, in a sense, in a coherent sense, ideology that, that uh, uh, drives them. Uh, what, what one finds in the rhetoric also is an incredible level of verbal violence. The, the uh, opponents are treated in, with contempt, uh, and uh, it's uh, not, not even you know, opponents and, and, and various august bodies, such as Supreme Court or the Constitutional Tribunal, the way they speak about them uh, is uh, um, mm, precisely the sort of contempt which, uh, uh, which has been already introduced into political parallels for quite a while. Uh, at the time when they were still in the opposition, the way they spoke about the president of Poland, Komorowski, Komorowski suddenly it became the the main uh, uh, sort of uh, the term that has emerged from the front, that undermines and delegitimizes the institutions in a very effective way. The question is, of course, uh, will, they, will there be a next step from verbal violence uh, to uh, actually physical violence in dealing with, uh, uh, with opponents? I'm uh, uh, very worried. I mean, this is the... the uh, again, an issue that had been discussed on a few, uh, in a few statements, um, um, Macarevich was preparing um, this territorial defense units uh, as part of a um, military establishment of which he is now uh, in command. Uh, and, uh, um, and essentially what, what will come out of it, uh, um, it, it it's very hard to tell, but it's, uh, they will have several tens of thousands of uh, thugs that will be um, kind of uh, uh, brought into the institutions uh, with uh, 
a certain mandate to use violence when called upon uh, by, um, by the regime. And as we know and as we heard, uh, they, they, they contemplate using these various patriotic associations that exist, perhaps the um, units of, 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 of people who identify as uh, um, soccer fans, uh, or, or, or ONR, a uh, camp of um, uh, national radical camp, just openly fascist organization in, its, uh, in, in the way it defines its uh, pedigree, so to speak, and, and, and the way it appears in the streets. So uh, uh, everything in that way uh, is uh, uh, pointing, uh, in fact, to further deterioration here of uh, now, having said that, let me uh, just uh, mm, uh, for a moment go, go back, if I may, for f five minutes to our discussion uh, concerning a difficult past and, and this uh, transitional uh, justice issues. Uh, it seems to me that the question of dealing uh, with, a, with a difficult past, at least in Eastern Europe, uh, both as it uh, uh, has to do with the, uh, the Second World War, and particularly uh, the, the Holocaust, of course, uh, and attitude of various elements of society you know, towards uh, the Jews um, at the time, and also uh, as far as it uh, is uh, concerned with communism and, uh, and sort of taking stock of that past and, and dealing with it. Transitional justice vocabulary and transi transitional justice implicit conceptualization here does not really grasp the, um, um, the essence of the problem. The, 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 the terminology such as apology, forgiveness, reconciliation, uh, which, which is part of transitional justice uh, vocabulary, if you wish implies and uh, uh, projects uh, uh, an image of uh, several protagonists, two protagonists, or as we saw from, for example, this very interesting uh, story that was told about uh, Baltic republics, you, you used the, the, the terms uh, victims and perpetrators. Well, uh, problems of dealing with difficult past are not really problems of uh, identifying culprits and then um, yeah, sort of measuring uh, their guilt and then uh, meeting out punishment. This is not a situation in which you have two protagonists confronting one another. Problems of dealing with difficult past are problems of looking on collective identity and restructuring it in such a way so that it would fit with and deal with the past, as it were. The, the, concerning the past, there are not only memory wars. There is also the past, things that happen. One, uh, if I may be positivistic, um, and, and it leaves artifacts. You know, there are graves, and uh, one can count bodies in it too. So um, I think that transitional justice uh, approach to uh, uh, confronting difficult past issues in, 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 in Eastern Europe is not really the way to go. And, and if I may end on uh, just quoting one of my favorite um, authors uh, uh, on, on Eastern Europe, uh, uh, Harlow, from his uh, essay on, on power and powerlessness, uh, uh, the powerless, it's, uh, you know, the, in totalitarian regimes, uh, the problem that we face is that in each of us there is an element of uh, uh, sort of uh, we get we get drawn into complicity, as it were, and uh, and uh, uh, that's that's the problem that has to be confronted. You know how of complicity in uh, whether as perpetrators or as facilitators or as beneficiaries. Uh, in uh, uh, enslavement or um, uh, violence, brutalities uh, that that uh, are that concern and are inflicted on the entire community, and and this community has to restructure and and re reinvent itself uh, in ways that will allow it to live with its own past. It seems to me that's that's what it, so the stakes are very high, 
uh, if you will. The, the stakes, if one may say this by analogy, it's like an individual person who has committed various things in the past and, uh, and has to be able to live with itself taking account and being aware. Otherwise, one is just gripped by psychosis or trauma. Collective entities, as it were, have to, have to do it in the same manner. And the last sentence, you should think about how Germany has dealt with its own past. Uh, there was, there were, this was a very long process and various stages of it, but a very important stage consisted in trying to identify within the German society, as it were, Nazis or organizations that would be responsible for violence. So it was SS, but not the Wehrmacht, you know, Nazis, but not the people who are not in the NSDAP. And it turned out to be uh, uh, really a flawed path. Uh, and, uh, and the way of reworking the past uh, had to do with uh, uh, really uh, thinking about uh, uh, this uh, uh, whole gestalt, as it were, and, and, uh, and, uh, and facilitators, and the fact that it, a phenomenon like this could emerge within German society, and that that you couldn't say, uh, nah, that, you know, oh, well, I wasn't, I wasn't in the SS, I'm fine.